Hello, my name is Paul Cyan, Realtor with HER Realtors, licensed in the state of Ohio and Kentucky. And with me today is Trey Butke of uh, Homebridge Financial Services. Welcome today, Trey. How are you doing? Thank you. I'm doing well, Paul. Yourself? I'm doing great. Good, good. Glad to have you on. So why don't we get started and uh, what, give us a little overview of yourself, you know, how long have you been in the industry and what's your job title and tell us about your company. Great. Well, uh, once again, Trey Budke, I'm with Homebridge Financial Services. We are a independently owned um, non-bank lender out of New Jersey, uh, currently licensed in almost all 50 states, probably three uh, that, that were not licensed in nationally. I personally am a branch manager at the Cincinnati location, okay, uh, as well as an originator, and I am licensed in the state of Ohio and Kentucky, and I've been in the mortgage business um, just over 18 years. Okay, wow. Well, so you got uh, some knowledge there, been through the uh, the ups and downs of the industry. I've seen some changes over the years, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That's... Uh, and probably none more than the last couple of years. Yeah, that's true. So if I'm a first-time home buyer, what's what's the best steps? Uh, what first steps should I be doing, and uh, why should I take those steps? Well, as a lender, I would think, uh, or I would prefer that your first step would be to talk to a lender um, and get yourself pre-approved. Okay. Uh, I would suggest a full-blown pre-approval where we're actually pulling your credit report, um, verifying your income, basically approving you as a borrower, and setting a maximum amount that you're qualified for borrowing. Um, and, you know, and seeing if that works against your um, your comfortability factor uh, as far as what a lot of people will come to me with a figure in their mind uh -huh. and then find out that, it, yeah, that really doesn't make sense for them or maybe they can actually afford a lot more than what they originally thought. Okay. And what, uh, and we mentioned a pre-approval letter. And what, what exactly is a pre-approval letter and how does that help? Pre-approval um, is basically it's that they're applying for a loan uh, with the exception that they don't have a property. Okay. So to do a full-blown pre-approval, um, I'm actually going to pull their credit bureau. I'm going to collect the supporting documents that verify their income and assets, and I'm actually going to have the loan underwritten. So they will be fully approved as a buyer subject to the property that they pick out. Okay. Really speeds things up in the long end um, when, they, when they do find that property. Okay. And what's the difference between... Uh... You know, we've heard of pre-qualification letters and pre-approval letters. What's pre-qualification is really is it's as good as the information that the borrower provides to the loan officer. It's really just a conversation they're having. We're not actually pulling their credit bureau. We're not actually verifying their income or their employment status. Okay. Um, so it's kind of saying if the information you've given me is correct, you should be able to do this. So it, it's a good first start. Okay. Um, and especially maybe if they say, maybe I am 12 months off from, from buying, that's probably the first step that they should do is at least talk to a lender. And then when they get a little more serious, um, go ahead and, and get that pre-approval done. Okay. And then, you know, talking to pre-approval, you said you kind of give a mount and it's even underwritten and, you know, I, I hate to use the word guaranteed because nothing is really guaranteed, but it, it's, right. it's close in a certain well, really, um, unless something changes with the borrower, um, i.e., they quit their job, um, they stop paying their bills, um, they spend their money, or they go out and take on a bunch of debt that okay. was undisclosed at the original application, really, they should be okay, or uh, once again, I, I, I would never use the word guarantee either, yeah. but they should be approved um, subject to the property that they pick out. Okay. You kind of mentioned, too, there are certain, certain aspects, certain things that the buyer could do that could result in their pre-approval being pulled. Yep. I've even heard of stories at the, at the closing table they're pulled. I mean, do you, what, what kind of examples do you know of? Well, not at the closing table, but I've actually got one going on right now where we, we always do a verification of employment, and then we do a verbal verification of employment within two days of closing. Okay. And I had one that just came back that the employee was terminated. Now, that doesn't mean they were fired, but it means they were no longer working at that company. Talking to the borrower, she got a better job. Okay. So she's going to be okay in the long run, but I have to wait until she gets a pay stub. Um, so it, it definitely delayed the process. And the loan has to be re-underwritten at that point because her employment changed. Yeah, and then from, um, from a real estate perspective, I mean, if the that 
that fi financing falls through, then the seller might be, you know, say, okay, I'm going to walk away from this deal. You can't, you can't come. Oh, through. absolutely. Or maybe the seller was um, counting on that closing to purchase their next house. True. And that person, the same thing. So it can really snowball. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's the communications key. Um, talking to the, you know, I try to, I try to coach um, my borrowers up front. You know, don't make any changes until this gets done. Don't go out and buy a new car. Lots of people want to put a new car in their new driveway, okay. um, but they should get the driveway first and then buy the new car. Okay. And so what happens on the day of uh, closing? I mean, what does the uh, the closer do? I know there's some kind of processing. They have to call the mortgager and, you know, uh, mm -hmm. call the lender, I mean. and The uh, day of closing, if everything is done properly up front, should really be a pretty smooth event. Um, the, the HUD-1 settlement statement should be out at least the day in advance. Okay. Um, so hopefully both the listing and selling agent have gone over that. Hopefully the, the loan officer has gone over it with the borrower and any questions or concerns have were addressed ahead of time. Um, so really once they get to the closing table, it's a matter of signing all the documents and there's a bunch of them, um, and exchanging checks and exchanging keys and, you know, happy homeowners. No happy home sellers. Um, the, like I said, the day off should be pretty smooth. Now, of course, it's not always, but it should be. Yeah, and I've heard a case from uh, one of our closers that I've worked with in the past, and he kind of made it, had a story of uh, where a person had bought a brand new sports car and was sitting out in the parking lot, kept bragging during the closing. So he was kind of forced to call the lender and say, "Hey, this person just admitted he bought a, a brand new sports car." You know, what do I do? And they ended up pulling the loan at, at that minute there. Yeah, that would be a really extreme example. Um, but yeah, you're right. Until until everything is signed and checks are exchanged and the, the mortgage is recorded, it's not a it's not a done deal. Yeah, so still, you know, keep be safe and don't do anything like you said. Wait wait till you get the driveway before you get the sports car. Absolutely. Okay. Prior to applying for the mortgage or, you know, getting a pre-approval letter, I mean, what's what's the best steps I need to do? What do I need to gather to bring to you? Okay. Two years is the magic number. That's what we're looking for. We're looking to cover two years of your employment. Okay. Uh, two years of your income. So that would go along with employment. So uh, tax returns. We want to get complete tax returns, all schedules. Okay. I may or may not actually end up turning those in with the file but it's really best to get them up front. Um, so complete tax returns, all schedules, um, and then W-2s or 1099s that go with those. Um, we're gonna verify two years of their um, residential history, okay. whether they currently own or they're currently renting, or even if they're you know, living with mom and dad. Two years residence uh, is, is, the, is the key figure that we're looking for. And then keep along with two, now I'm going to collect two months of bank statements or any asset statements that they would have. So I would definitely um, include as much as I can to make the file as strong as I can from the beginning. Once again, I may not end up turning everything in, Okay. Um, but it's really a good idea to get it all up front and really see what we're dealing with. So assets, uh, bank, checking, savings. CDs, investment accounts, um, if they've got a retirement account, we may not necessarily be using that to qualify for the loan, but it's going to demonstrate an ability to save money while not getting in debt, so it's going to make the file a stronger file. Okay. It would actually be looked at as reserves. Okay. And then, uh, you know, let's say I'm a small business owner and most of my earnings come in cash, you know, I've got a store or something like that, and how, how, how do you justify that or how do you... How does the uh, borrower work with that? It can be difficult, um, especially with the self-employed borrower. Um, we're looking at their tax returns, and that's really what it's coming down to. So if they, if it's, if it's reportable income, okay. and, and they are reporting it, we can use it. Um, so we're going to look at, at, you know, some businesses are um, cash flow type businesses, so it makes sense. Uh, so it have to, it would have to make sense for the type of business that you owned. Okay. And then, we, you know, I guess this part kind of comes where the underwriter comes in. And I had a question about uh, an underwriter. What is it? Who are they exactly? And uh, how are they related in your company? And what do they do? Yeah, underwriters are usually people that have been in the business quite a while. They usually start off in the processing area. Okay. 
Um, and then uh, as they gain experience, they become junior underwriters and eventually full-fledged underwriters, uh, maybe even DE underwriters, which is um, a person who can underwrite government loans. Okay. Um, so they are the person that is verifying um, what the processor put together and presented to them. They're going to make sure that the loan uh, falls within all the parameters of the secondary market. Okay. So whether it's a conforming loan, they're looking at Freddie, Freddie Mac or Fannie Mae uh, lending guidelines, uh, or a government loan, uh, whether it be FHA or USDA or VA. Um, each one of those loans will have their own specific guidelines uh, to be for that loan to be sold in the secondary market, and that's really what the underwriter is doing. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about uh, you know credit scores and ability mm -hmm. to get a mortgage. I mean, if, you know, I know there's government programs that kind of overlook some credit scores. What can you tell me about you know if I've got a? So let's talk about uh, credit scores and how that has uh, an effect on the ability to get a mortgage. What you what can you tell me about credit scores and? Sure. Well, credit score is it's key to obtaining a mortgage. There are different credit score requirements for different loan programs. Okay. So a lot of times people look at FHA and say it's a first-time home buyer program. Well, a lot of first-time home buyers do use FHA, but it's not specifically for a first-time home buyer. Okay. So you can be a second-time home buyer using an FHA loan. A lot of times people will use FHA because they don't qualify for a conventional loan whether it's down payment wise or credit score wise. So an FHA loan, as an example, will let you have what I would consider to be less than perfect credit. Okay. Um, a, a lower credit score than the minimum required to do a conventional financing loan. You have any suggestions on how people can improve their credit scores? Yeah, I mean, there's certainly, there's, there's credit companies out there that can help you rebuild a credit situation. If it's a situation where you just don't have credit, um, the first thing I always suggest is that somebody gets a secured credit card. Okay. What we want to see and what most loan programs want to see is that you have at least a two-year history of credit. And they're looking at the most recent one-year history as most important. So you want to see at least a two-year history of credit and preferably you want to see no blemishes at all in the last 12 months. Okay. Let's talk about, uh, you know, we're talking about credit topic. There's also uh, foreclosures, short sales, bankruptcies. I mean, they all have an impact on credit. Absolutely. How much of an impact does that have on, on a mortgage? I mean, if I had a bankruptcy three months ago, can I come in and apply for a mortgage? Um, you can always apply for a mortgage. It's whether or not you're going to qualify is, is the key. You know, traditional mortgages, your conventional, your FHA, your VA, your USDA, each one of those has its own specific cutoff on time frame that you have to uh, be discharged from your bankruptcy. Okay. So, and that changes um, as throughout the years. So it's gotten a little tighter okay. um, over the last couple of years in what a lot of people would consider to be the credit crunch that we had. Yeah. Um, but you're looking at, you know, a two year time frame on FHA. Okay. Um, up, to, up to five to seven years on some of the conventional financing. Now, there are some lenders out there that might have a portfolio loan, something that's not being sold in the secondary market, where you may qualify um, in a time frame that is shorter than that. There's also some, um, some extenuating circumstances. Um, you know, if you can prove that the bankruptcy was due to something out of your control, like a, a health crisis, medical bills, um, yeah. medical bills or, or even loss of a job sometimes, if you can, you know, if a whole town was had a factory go out, something like that. If you can document that with third parties, it's possible that you can get an exception to those time frames. Okay. And so this short sales, foreclosure, bankruptcy, are, do they have all a similar effect? Or are they... they all have a similar effect. They sure do. Okay. Yeah. Go on now and talk about, uh, you know, I'm wanting to get a mortgage for myself and then uh, what's, how do I know what I'm, what's the best mortgage? I mean, I guess there's a, interest rates and uh, you know fees and stuff like that you know how do I know yeah you want to work with a lender that can do more than one type of loan so somebody who's well versed in, in all the loan programs that are out there um, and then you need to talk with them and figure out you know what's most important to you is it payment is it down payment um, you know interest rate 
you know, sometimes the loan with the lowest interest rates not necessarily the best loan out there. It may cost more um, up front, or it could have mortgage insurance piece with it that ultimately ends up costing you more on a monthly basis. So looking at different options um, and kind of, I, I tend to present them side by side. Okay. And I think the the loan program that is suited for the individual tends to speak to that individual, and they, and they tend to guide themselves into it, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it does. And we're talking about the best mortgages. I, I guess we, you know, we kind of mentioned the FHA and the, you know, there's VA mortgages too for certain people. What uh, can you briefly talk about the different types? And you know, I know conventional FHA, VA kind of. Sure, sure. Conventional loans. Um, are generally for someone with at least 5% down. Um, there would be mortgage insurance required on, on that loan until they have a 20% a, a equity position in the loan. Okay. Um, so there would be mortgage insurance with it as well. Um, typically, we're pretty much in a fixed rate market right now. There are adjustable rates available on conventional loans as well. It's, it's been a while since I've written an adjustable rate mortgage though. Um, you know, thirty-year fixed, fifteen-year fixed has been has been the popular way to go with those. Mm -hmm. um, if someone has less down payment, um, then they're probably looking at the FHA loan, which requires three and a half percent down payment. Uh, once again, still has mortgage insurance on it, and that's that's a government-backed loan, correct? That is a government-backed loan, correct? Um, and then if they're a veteran, um, then they may qualify for a VA loan, which is actually a 0% down loan, um, which has a, um, it doesn't have the monthly uh, mortgage insurance piece on it. So that's a great loan if you're a veteran, um, the, the VA loan. And then there are other loan programs, Paul, like the USDA loan, which would require zero down, but it's specific to a certain area of, of the state. Okay. So... You know, if the more if the closer you get into the city, the less likely that program is going to fit. So that program, I would say, is more property specific than borrower specific. Okay. Let's move on to, uh, you know, now I'm a seller. I'm I'm taking the role of a seller, and mm -hmm. I'm gonna I'm gonna sell my house. Is what what should I do mortgage wise that uh, to get ready for the sale? Well, the first thing I would want to know is what my payouts were. So I would probably order those um, okay. ahead of time. And they generally, you know, people will look at their balance and think that's their payoff, and it's not because mortgage interest is paid in arrears. So there's still, um, there's daily interest that's accruing on that. So I would, I'd want to know what my payoff was on that. And then, uh, you know, once I sell my house and we've closed, is, am I free and clear of that debt? You know, we're, we're good to go. Technically, you're good to go as far as purchasing something else, um, but the the servicer of that mortgage has to release the mortgage. Okay. Um, but it can be a simultaneous thing, so you don't necessarily have to sell your house first before you go out and obtain a new mortgage. Um, you know, it all depends on whether you qualify with without selling your current house or not. So it may be a situation where you you need the proceeds from your current house to apply to the new loan. In that case, um, you have to close it first, but it could be a simultaneous closing or a back-to-back -back closing. Okay. Um, if you're not using the down payment or money, the equity from your current home, um, then, and you qualify for it, you could certainly have more than one mortgage out at a time. Okay. Um, so sometimes I've seen people who will rent a property uh, or just take their time selling it, but go ahead and purchase their new home. Okay. And that kind of leads into, uh, you know, you kind of partially answered this, but, you know, I'm, I need to pay off my mortgage and I'm going to buy a new house. How, how does that overlap work? You know, I'm still currently in the house. I need to apply for a mortgage. Does the lender take into account that, you know, my house is on the, on the market? They'll pre-approve me for a certain amount. They, they'll either pre-approve you subject to selling your current house. Okay. Or they will uh, pre-approve you covering both mortgages. Okay. So it really depends on the individual uh, and where their down payment for their new home is coming from. Okay. So let's say we do have a, you know, I have two homes, you know, one's a rental. I'm getting a rental income from that. And then one, one home I'm planning on selling to move to a new home. How, how does the, uh, the rental home take account, you know, in terms of the, the debt levels and the, does the income 
I get from the rental account towards my income as well? Depends. It, it depends on um, how long you've been a landlord. If this is a new property that you're turning into a rental property, um, it's probably going to be difficult to give you income for it. But if you put the property under lease, um, we can generally um, not count most of that debt against your qualifying um, for, the, for your new loan. Uh, if it's a, an existing property that you and you've been a landlord in the past, um, yeah, we'll look at your tax returns. And okay. if you're claiming your uh, if you're claiming the income on your tax returns, we'll absolutely use that income to uh, to help you qualify. Okay, so yeah, it is it is possible and doesn't really affect you that bad depending on the time. I guess you mentioned earlier in the the uh, the twelve twelve month kind of look back period. Last twelve months is is generally going to be the most important uh, in all aspects of your applying for the mortgage. Okay, well, great. That's that's all of the questions I have for you today. Do you have any final closing thoughts you'd like to share? Paul, I just want to thank you for having me in today. Um, if anyone uh, you know needs any help mortgage-wise, I'm happy to help. Um, and I'm sure you know you work with some other lenders. You'll make a referral. But I definitely would uh, want people out there getting qualified before they're out uh, you know driving around looking at houses. Yeah, that helps them get an idea of what they can afford and what they should be looking at. Well, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I've seen the people that go out and look first and they get an idea in their head of what they think they can afford to find out that they're just not going to qualify. And it, it ruins everybody's day. So, yeah, yeah, it's a big emotional process. Absolutely. Thank you, Trey, for being on my podcast. Uh, we'll include your contact information on the, uh, the links. So if anybody wants to find Trey, it, uh, that information will be there. Thank you again. Appreciate it, Paul.